our um, fourth day of this very interesting course. We have had um, a very positive feedback and in fact, we thank you very much for your feedback. We see that it is beneficial to many of you and uh, that you're appreciating the content um, that we are providing to you. As you well know, this, uh, um, this course is the fruit of a project um, in collaboration with several uh, institutions of uh, international repute, uh, including the four um, heavy iron therapy um, uh, infrastructures, as well as um, several um, research labs um, dealing with uh, heavy ions. I would like to thank all participants and all contributors, um, especially Yota and uh, her team of students who you have met even in the social events. They are doing a fantastic job and we thank you for your encouragement. We would like to remind you to once again um, um, fill in the evaluation form so that we can improve for the courses that we're planning um, um, over the next few months. We will be informing you um, about these courses um, uh, as we go along. Okay, so we yesterday we had a very interesting program. Um, we started uh, yesterday with uh, linear accelerators and then we had um, injection to synchrotrons. Then we had also beam extraction methods. We discussed imaging and radiotherapy and we continued with our hands-on uh, sessions uh, in imaging and radiotherapy, uh, sorry, in treatment and radio uncertainties. And then we looked at range verification methods. Today we have um, an equally interesting um, um, program. We will start with uh, gantries and beam delivery, and then we will look at the beam instrumentation. Um, then we'll look at the basics of accelerator control systems. And we'll have an introduction to radio biology, as well as dose optimization. Can participants please switch off their mic? After the lunch break, we will um, again uh, have our hands-on sessions um, with in this case, we will focus more on biological and carbon um, uh, treatment planning. Uh, and then at the end of the day, we will have our interaction with experts, um, some student presentations and the, and the virtual visits. Um, and then um, uh, to finish off, we will have a, um, a social event, of course, virtually. Okay, this time it will be games and disco. We have had um, some very positive uh, feedback, in fact, of these social events, uh, um, very original, in fact, and uh, um, we would like to invite all participants to attend these social events. Uh, um, from experience, when you meet people, even socially in these courses, you will meet these as colleagues uh, in your career, and I have continued to meet people like this um, uh, throughout my own career, and I would encourage you, in fact, not to underestimate these social events. So let's move on with our program. It is a pleasure for me to now introduce Elena Benedetto, um, um, good old friend of mine, in fact, um, um, spent several years at CERN, um, and now she is representing the Terra Foundation. Um, um, Elena is um, um, working um, on, on new designs, in fact, of, of um, systems for heavy ions, and that is why we asked Elena to provide us with um, a presentation on gantries and beam delivery. Elena, it is a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for accepting our invitation and I give you the floor. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Nick. Uh, pleasure. Uh, am I allowed to share the screen? Not yet, perhaps. Here I am. You see the mouse, you hear my voice, everything is fine, right? Yes, everything is okay. Very good. Okay, indeed, uh, now I'm hired by CIST, the CIST Association, 
to coordinate the design of the of the synchrotron and on, on the technical uh, the technical part. Uh, so, but I spent a few years uh, with the Terra Foundation, and that's why where uh, where I learn uh, where, where I learned this job on medical uh, medical applications to to accelerators. The talk of today will be about uh, what do you do with your beam once uh, it is extracted from the synchrotron. So once uh, Rebecca did uh, her job to provide us with a slow extracted and smooth uh, spill. Um, well, we transport it to the lines. So we transport it to the treatment rooms. So this is the synchrotron. This is where the extraction takes place. This is uh, uh, what we call high energy beam transfer habit. And then the beam is transported to the, to the treatment rooms. In this configuration, which is what is planned for CIST, we have three treatment rooms uh, here, um, where uh, here is where the patient is sitting. So um, you basically have the beam coming from the synchrotron, you bend it with these red uh, things that represent quadruples. Then you transport it and you focus with quadruples and then you have a special system to, to to precisely uh, deliver the dose uh, to the patient. And this is a representation of, uh, of a superconducting entry that uh, we plan to have. And on this other side, the CIST foresee some experimental rooms. So uh, yeah, this is uh, the, the implementation of a facility, but all of them look, uh, look very similar. So first uh, we have this high energy beam transfer. Then we have the part close to the, to the patient. We call it the treatment line. Uh, it can be fixed or it can be rotating, so a gantry. I will discuss pensive beam scanning only and how do we achieve it? And what do we do also to achieve longitudinal scanning? How do we mo modulate the energy in the, in the synchrotron? And then, uh, okay, the gantry. And I will reply to one of the questions that were raised in the previous, uh, in the previous discussions. Okay, why I cannot, here we are. Yes, as I said, CIST is just one of the thousands of implementation that exists. This is another one, much more compact. This is the heat Heidelberg in Germany, and you recognize the, the sources, the Linux, the synchrotron, the, the, the fixed lines, and the huge carbon ion gantries that was already discussed. Now, Again, a recap of uh, the accelerator physics lectures that Pajus gave uh, a few days ago, because uh, all the basis uh, lies on what uh, he, he showed you a few days ago. So we need uh, dipoles who bend the beam and send it where we want to the treatment room and to the patient. And we need quadruples to focus the beam. Unfortunately, fo quadruples focus in one plane, but they focus in the other. And we call it uh, F when it focuses in the horizontal and it focuses in, uh, in vertical and vice versa D when it does the other way around. And an alternation of focusing, defocusing element provide a net focusing effect. So we are in good hands if we rely on quadruples. Then we have the usual uh, ellipse and uh, its shapes evolves along the, along the beam line. And uh, the beam size is basically is the projection of this ellipse on the, on, the, on the x axis or on the y axis. And it is proportional to the square root of what we call beta function. And it also depends on the, on the emitters. Uh, now, um, the habit has to bring the beam to the room of the patient with the correct size and uh, with the correct ellipse orientation. And this is achieved with quadruples. You see here the, um, the equation of motion uh, through your beam line, M is the multiplication of quadruples, the focusing and the focusing and bending parts, et cetera, et cetera. If you manage to invert this equation, you get the coefficients of your quadruples and uh, other elements. Okay, maybe it's not that easy to invert this matrix, and therefore you have some iterative methods or some uh, uh, some algorithm to, to solve this problem and to match, to match. So to change the strength of the quadruple, the, the, the strength, the, the straight section, etc., to to get with the correct um, the correct functions. 
One extra ingredient, also uh, Marius already introduced you, is the dispersion. And this is the dependence of the position on the beam energy. This is very important for the, for the lines and for the gantry because let's imagine that the dispersion is uh, one, um, one unit, one meter, okay? Uh, this is always what happens, one meter or two. Then uh, if the beam is not perfectly centered in energy, but it has an error, an error in the momentum, relativistic momentum is linked to the energy, an error of five per mil, then the position of your beam will be already offset by, by five millimeters. And this is a lot, okay? You cannot afford to, to be offset in the patient by, by that much. And that's why one of the requirements of um, a beam line or of a gantry is that the patient, we need to have this dispersion equal to zero. Dispersion is like the beta function. It depends uh, on the on the longitudinal um, position, and uh, um, again, it's with quadruples that you that you that you match it to the correct uh, values that uh, that you want. Okay, now um, we reached the uh, the treatment room. We reached the part where the beam is really prepared to be delivered to the patient, and here. Uh, I show you these slides from uh, Jean Seco on, um, on the first days, uh, where you see what is the pencil beam scanning versus uh, a uh, passive scattering. Uh, with this method, you deliver the beam only where the tumor is. Okay, so in this part here, uh, Rebecca switches off the beam from the synchrotron. Uh, she's off the uh, RF exciter, and here it's on again so that uh, she can deliver the, the beam only when, when it is needed. And this is very useful, of course, because uh, you can spare the GLT um, tissue and deliver the dose precisely where, where you want. So how do we achieve this, um, this uh, scanning, this 3D scanning? Okay, so this is what happened in the transverse plane. In the transverse plane, we have a fast and very powerful scanning magnet. Scanning magnets, again, they are dipoles, okay? Dipoles, uh, here you have a vertical uh, magnetic field which bend the beam in the horizontal plane. Here you have vertical, uh, yeah, um, vertical dipole with magnetic field here that bends the beam in the vertical plane. And then you have some drift space to, to uh, to make sure that the angle is converted into position and finally some, uh, some monitors of the beam delivery system and finally the tumor. And you can scan around, around that. Um, and this is uh, uh, a picture of uh, the scanning system of now at one of the fixed lines. You see, this is the first band. You recognize it because it has only two, two coils and the beam, uh, beam magnetic field is here vertical. And this is, these are the two the two pieces of, um, of, uh, of iron. And this is the same band, but it is um, uh, rotated by 90 degrees so that you get uh, bending in the other, in the opposite direction. Uh, so this is for the transverse plane. What about the third dimension, the longitudinal uh, plane? Okay, here we, we count on the black piece on a very specific location deep in the tumor. And if you vary the energy of, of your beam, you can change the position of the black peak inside the tissue and paint different energy slices. Like an example, if we want to go as deep as 30 centimeters of a water equivalent, we need to have such energies. For the protons, it's 250 MeV. For the carbon ions, it's much higher. Uh, and now, how do we vary the beam energy? Well, it depends on the, on, the, on the machine that you have upstream. If you have a cyclotron, we already said the energy is fixed. So you do it with the uh, insertions in the, in the line with the graders. If you had a full Linux solution, then you can do it nicely and very fast. Well, let's say the sum of the RF cavities. And finally, if you have a synchrotron, uh, well, it's even easier because uh, accelerating the beam to the so this is magnet in the tapos. The is the same as the momentum. They are the 
we propose. And this means that very low magnetic field and low energy of your here. So instead of playing dumping the beam, accelerating again, etc., etc., you can store all the particles here at injection and then accelerate to the top energy and then have a staircase. And for every step that you have, you extract a bit of beam. This is much faster. This is what they do in Japan, cars in operation. And this is uh, uh, what they study also at um, Heidelberg and uh, all the European facility. And some of them uh, are, almost, uh, are almost there. Uh, okay, you can have a staircase going down or a staircase going up. Uh, but the important point is that you, you, you dramatically reduce the, the time in between different spills at different energies. Of course, the drawback is that you have to inject all your beam at the very beginning. And that's why uh, my presentation of uh, yesterday, how to inject uh, uh, much more intensity in, in a synchrotron. This is what we plan to do for CIST. Okay, gantries. Why do we need gantries? We need gantries to deliver the beam for multiple angle, angles. Why? To spare organ and risks. Now, these session, and you have realized how to deliver those. You manage to spare organ at risks. It has a lot of advantages, and that's why we build such a huge, huge instruments. However, what is uh, uh, a gantry? Well, a gantry is simply a beam line, huh? nothing more. Uh, it has vacuum chamber, it has dipoles, quadruple instrumentations, but it is rotating. And that's why such a huge structure that goes with it. Uh, it has to rotate in order to direct the beam to the isocenter, so to the patient, from any direction. But everything that we said for the fixed line is still valid. We need to arrive there with the correct size, the match ellipse, zero dispersion. So everything is still valid. The only complication is that uh, this, uh, this uh, set of uh, dipoles in quadruples, it is rotating. So you have the synchrotron lines in the horizontal plane, and then you have a gantry, which has some angle with respect to the horizontal plane. So the gantry uh, yeah, uh, rotates on this axis so that it arrives at the patient and the tumor location from the angle that, uh, that you want. Okay, so we have gantry for all kinds of uh, uh, radiotherapy. And uh, here I will show you the difference between gantries for uh, uh, X-rays, uh, so electrons are accelerated and then uh, sent to a target where, where they do beam strahlung and produce uh, X-rays. And you see, this is a, a typical uh, uh, machines that you have in hospital. The LIDNAC is, is actually here inside and then the beam is transported here. And this is the, the target and then we produce X-rays that goes to the patient. But then let's put it uh, in the, with the right uh, proportions and compare it to what we have uh, for protons. Protons, huh? not carbon ions. So you see, I, I try to, man, to make the, 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 the person here of the same size. And you already see how larger is a gantry for, uh, for protons. Uh, but still, the, the patient will be, will be here inside this part. And this will be nicely um, put in a medical environment. So this will be all white and clean. And this is on the back of the laboratory where all the technicalities are. But here you, you will have a line of magnets and then this, uh, the treatment room. But then uh, one step further, let's see what happened with carbon ions. Carbon ions is really huge. Again, the same man with the same size as before, uh, but clearly um, it's three times higher than uh, a proton gantry. Uh, so why so? Well, because uh, different particles have different uh, energy and different rigidity. 
And what is the rigidity? The rigidity is uh, the difficulty to bend the beam. So you have uh, the, the equation of motion uh, when you have particles in a magnetic field, you uh, yeah, do some easy maths uh, and have this B rho equal to the momentum divided by the charge. Now B is the magnetic field, rho is the radius of curvature, P is the momentum, so the energy of your particle, and this is the, the charge. And you see that uh, electrons have a beam rigidity, a B rho of uh, <clears throat> 0 0.07 Tesla meter, which is really low. Protons already go to 2.5 Tesla meters, carbon ions a factor three higher. And that's why the dimensions vary a lot because we have, a, um, of course, a limit in the magnetic field that we can put in a magnet and for normal conducting magnets, we have 1.5 Tesla for, for your bending. And this defines the curvature radius of the entire system, which is uh, less than two meters for protons, more than four meters for carbon ions. And now, uh, I mean, the, 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 the solution comes pretty natural. What can we do? We increase further the magnetic field. So we go to superconducting magnets where we can have a, a magnetic field of more than three Tesla and uh, reduce the radius of curvature to uh, having a, a, a beam size similar to the one for protons. And this is what they did in Japan. They currently use a much uh, compact gantry. This can, gantry is only 300 tons instead of the 600 of, uh, of the Heidelberg one, and is made with superconducting magnets. Now, within uh, ETRI Plus uh, and uh, for CEAST and for other uh, facility, we are studying an even more compact system um, based on a similar dipole magnets uh, or more complex. We want to um, reduce the weight of the structure and make it a factor 10 uh, lighter. And this is achieved with a very special structure that is attached to the wall and therefore rotates uh, less uh, than, uh, than the full 300 degree. Uh, indeed, when you design a degante, you have to make some choices. One of the choices is choosing the angle of the rotation of the gantry then the position of the fast scanning magnets. And finally, since the timing is limited, I will only discuss how, what are the choices that, they, that you can do to deal with the beam coming from uh, the synchrotron, which is non-symmetric. Now, angle of rotation. The Japanese gantry rotates by 360 degrees uh, around this very, very robust and uh, but heavy structure. Our proposal is to have a gantry which is fixed to the wall and therefore rotates by only um, yeah, more than 180 degrees, let's say 200, 220. And you see here in this picture, uh, this is a proton gantry by Mavion. You see here from these pictures the advantages to have uh, a, a smaller rotation angle. So all the mechanics is hidden behind the wall. And here you only have uh, the, the treatment room. And you see that uh, since it is not 360 degrees, the treatment room is much larger. Here you can fit the bed and nice and it's not claustrophobic. Um, so you have more space, uh, however, um, to complete the treatment, the bed of the patient uh, at some point might, must be rotated by, by 180 degrees to, to do the full, the, full, um, the full treatment. Advantages and disadvantages. Up, uh, up to the designer to make a choice and to the clinical users. Um, the other, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Another choice is that you must do is where you put the scanning systems. The scanning system, we saw it before for the, for the fixed line here, and you need to have very strong and powerful magnets. Here they are represented in yellow. And here you see a typical degree where you have dipoles that bend the beam, quadruples to focus and to, to match it to the correct shape, another dipole and a third dipole, other quadruples, and here are the scanning system in yellow. 
And you see that if you can afford to put the scanning system upstream of the last bending magnets, you manage to go to the patient with a very nice and parallel beam. However, this uh, uh, final dipole will be huge because uh, you have to have enough aperture to fit the beam which has been bent. When I say huge is really a bore of uh, uh, 20, 20 centimeter. Um, when you decide to have the scanning system downstream of the last magnets, there, um, the, 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 the scanning magnets will be much, uh, sorry, the, the, the last bending magnets will be, can be much smaller. So less than uh, 10 centimeters um, aperture. And uh, it's more compact, it's easier to do, especially if you uh, go for a superconducting uh, technology. Uh, however, you see that uh, here the beams, the, the scanning system is closer to the patient. So perhaps you need to have some more distance between the patient and the treatment. And the beam is not nice and parallel as before. But you have other advantages. So again, a compromise must be made. And now let me uh, spend one last slide to discuss uh, what do you do with, with asymmetric beams before concluding and be uh, open to, to your questions. So a uh, beam coming from a synchrotron is not symmetric. Uh, yesterday I showed you uh, beam ellipses that can be transformed into circles. And uh, normally the, the beam ellipse uh, nicely fill the entire ellipse or circle. And this is what happened like in a, in a vertical plane when you extract. However, in the horizontal plane, the beam is not an ellipse, but it is a so-called bar of charge. Bar of charge means that in one dimension, so in, um, in one dimension is very thin and in the other dimension is large. So depending how this, uh, uh, what was an ellipse, but now it is a bar of charge is uh, orientated in your face space, the beam size, which I remind you is the projection of this ellipse on the horizontal axis, uh, you can achieve different beam size. Um, when you enter a gantry, the gantry uh, must provide the very same beam, whatever is the angle. So whether the gantry is horizontal or vertical or with some uh, oblique uh, direction. So how do you deal with this? You have different options. One is that you do it uh, as they do in, um, in HIMAC in Japan, you blow up the beam in the horizontal plane. So instead of having a, such a thin beam, you blow it up and you fill the circle. And then you have a round beam and you do your manipulation. Or you have some kind of a partial matching and you say, okay, I don't really mind. As long as the two beams are round, meaning that the beam size in the X and in the Y direction is similar. So this projection here is similar. I don't care about this shape, but I do some matching anyway with my quadrants. This is feasible uh, and requires some special conditions on, uh, on the transport matrix, but it, this is what can be done. Third possibility, you use a rotator. The rotator is a set of quadruples that uh, rotates with the gantry, but if the gantry is rotating by 90 degrees, this rotator uh, rotates by 45 degrees and so on and so forth. And with this, you can pre-adjust your beam so that it enters in the gantry with the correct shape and you don't need to worry about anything. This is the, the best solution. However, it requires uh, a lot of space. So 10 meters even no? in, the, in the line. And then, okay, there is a fourth, uh, uh, <laughs> a fourth uh, solutions that I didn't mention, but it is do not use the synchrotron, use the cyclotron. Cyclotron has round beads. However, there are some complications even. Okay, that's it from me. To conclude, beam lines to the patients need a very fast scanning system to uh, scan transversely the tumor 
and uh, some energy variation line or on the gantry to focus the beam and to provide the correct uh, matched condition for it to um, reach correctly the patients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elena, for that very interesting talk. Um, um, we now open the floor for questions. We have uh, sent the link in the chat um, for, for you to fill up, um, to fill in your questions. And Aris is going to help us with uh, putting it online. Um, Ellen, I leave it up to you to, to, to go through them one by one. Okay, you mentioned about partial matching techniques. It was developed for heat, but still they have gantry angle dependent limb optics. So the partial matching is not working. To make, uh, we have the problem of asymmetric emittance in the synchrotron based facility. Okay, uh, so do we have the problem of uh, asymmetric emittance in the synchrotron based facility? Well, uh, no, in the cyclotron, the emittance comes up, uh, 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 the beam comes up nicely round. Um, okay, so at heat it doesn't work. Uh, um, well, then it depends on, uh, on how the, the things was done. Uh, perhaps they, they tried, but they didn't have enough, uh, enough flexibility with their optics. So it's a choice uh, to make it compact. Uh, it's, it was the very first gantry in operation and uh, it's providing a robust and reliable beam. So uh, congratulations to them. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, many years have uh, gone uh, and perhaps uh, we can do better. Uh, if we cannot make it, uh, we still can uh, have the solution of uh, having uh, uh, multiple uh, library of configurations as they have, uh, but we will try to, to do it the, I mean, the, the, the good way, I would say. Is it important to have imaging between gantry entrance and user center? Yes. If yes, what imaging factor is best for gantry beam optic designs? Um, yes, you decide. Uh, again, it's a matter of how the beams evolve in the lines, how the emittance is pulsing, and what is the aperture required. In the designs that we have, uh, um, I found an imaging factor of one to one. So they're the same beam size at the beginning and the same beam size at the end. At the end. There are other design which use even a different, uh, a different matching condition. So instead of having uh, the same beam size at the entrance and at the end, you have uh, um, angle to point, uh, angle to point uh, matching. And uh, yeah, everybody does his own way. Uh, it depends on the on your configuration of quadrupoles elements. What are the main requirements of gantry beam optics? Uh, yes, correctly. I, I didn't go in too much details about that, but I showed you that the dispersion must be zero at the patient and the entire system should be achromatic. And then there is this imaging condition. So from the beginning to the end of the gantry. And uh, uh, okay, I see that we still have a lot of questions. So maybe I can come back uh, to, to uh, further on that, but uh, let me reply to all the others. What is the maximum emittance to sigma we could transport to a gantry? Uh, 30, 60, 100, 120. Uh, okay, this uh, it's a bit, uh, I prefer not to answer because uh, we first of all have to make sure what is the emittance. Um, in um, this is the geometrical emittance, so it depends on the beam energy. So I cannot give you one of these numbers because it depends on the energy of your beam. In normalized conditions, uh, isn't there? It depends. Let's assume whether that we have a normalized one micrometers emittance. Um, we multiply by a factor of four to take into account the full beam. Um, and then you have uh, the, the aperture of the magnets accordingly. If your magnets are larger, you can transport more. What is the standard emittance values for proton therapy gantry and why? Uh, same question as before, it's uh, around uh, one micrometers normalized RMS. How do we make the beam round? Uh, it's more or less uh, what uh, I tried to explain. So uh, the beam size is the product of the beta function 
and the emittance. The emittance is uh, constant, is a property of your beams. The beta function is uh, a property of your lattice. So you can change the beta function at the isocenter to have a, a beam which, is, which has the same dimension in both horizontal and vertical plane. Then in most of the gantries, there are beam losses. How to minimize the losses and achieve maximum transmission to gantry? Okay, uh, I would say that there are beam losses, oh wow, in cyclotrons gantry. Um, so in uh, gantries coupled with the cyclotrons, because the beam coming from the cyclotrons is uh, huge and you need collimations and degraders and other insertions to, to get to the correct uh, and to the wanted uh, energy and uh, uh, beam size. Uh, so that's why you have losses. Uh, in a um, gantry coupled with a cyclotron, um, or in a LINAC, uh, we have uh, a very well-defined beam with already the correct uh, dimension entering the gantry and the correct energy. So we do not need uh, these uh, uh, degraders that cause beam losses. Why CERN is working on toroidal gantry while superconducting gantry has more advantages? Well, because toroidal gantry uh, is a fancy project. I, I didn't show you a picture, but uh, as soon as I saw it, I, I mean, I got fascinated. Imagine a system without the complication to have a rotation. Okay, you have it there, it's fixed, it doesn't move. It's like doing an MRI. Uh, you, 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 you do it and from the mechanical point of view, everything is still. Uh, that would be the, the I mean, the, 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 the future. I mean, a big, uh, a big uh, a disruptive things. However, and this is superconducting, by the way. However, the technology is not yet mature. And that's why in parallel with that, always at CERN, we also uh, consider uh, conventional rotating superconductor in gantry. And uh, indeed, uh, we, we leverage on the knowledge of CERN on superconducting uh, uh, magnets. According to you, which type of gantry is the best? I think I replied. In your graph of multi-energy extraction, that does each step in the graph refer to each energy layer delivered to the patients? Yes. So every step um, is a different energy layer. Is it correct that at the rotating location of a gantry, the beam ellipse is upright? Um, not necessarily, however, it is preferable. Uh, you have the, the possibility to have uh, uh, the size that fits you best. Uh, but yes, normally you want to have it upright because it has other properties. What is the cost difference between a fixed beam versus a gantry beam room? Okay, yes, the, the gantry is much more uh, expensive. Uh, okay, uh, I would say a factor, uh, uh, factor 10, I would say, so uh, even more. Huh? A gantry is uh, meant to cost uh, 30 million, something like this, that more or less depends on the, on the provider. And there, is not a, there are not even providers for, for carbon ions gantry. What is the advantage of a synchrotron over a cyclotron? Um, okay, let me do later. What is the difference between the gantry of cyclotron Clotron and those of carbon X-ray and proton ions. Okay, yes. So these two are, are um, kind of um, linked. So uh, a synchrotron provides beam uh, to the gantry with a very um, defined energy that you can decide upstream when the beam is still in the machine and a very, um, I mean, uh, and with some shape. A cyclotron provides you a beam at a fixed energy, and therefore, in order to go to the correct, uh, to, the, the, to the energy that you choose, you are obliged to um, insert some device that degrade the energy contents, and then you select only one part with the correct energy. Plus, going through this degrader, you have losses and you blow up your beam. So then you also need to have some collimation system that cuts out all the beam that you do not need because it's out of the acceptance of the gantry. Uh, so these two things are... Uh, yeah. Please switch off your mics. 
Participants, please switch off your microphones. So these two machines are pretty different, really from the concept. Cyclotron is uh, uh, much cheaper and easy and easier to, to operate. A synchrotron is more complex, perhaps more expensive, but it is more flexible. It avoids, you avoid a lot of losses and uh, um, uh, yeah, it's two different concepts. Now the trend is to go to synchrotrons which are smaller and smaller and easier to operate. Uh, but still cyclotrons are, um, are more, um, I mean, uh, easy to, to do. Uh, still for cyclotrons, uh, you cannot uh, have, uh, well, there is only one project ongoing of a synchro, synchro, cyclotron, sorry, for uh, uh, carbon ions. But uh, so far, the only facility that deliver carbon ions are cyclotrons because of the dimension, because of the beam rigidity, which is much higher. And what is the difference between the country of, uh, yeah, cyclotrons is uh, a proton gantry, mostly. Um, yeah, X-rays I discussed, carbon gantries are uh, much bigger. So I think I, I'm done with the questions, unless you have something else, I give you back the floor, Nick. Okay, so we have uh, another two 